said to a couple of people I've met already that this is my first ever meetup, so please be nice to me. <laughs> um, I actually, I do really want it to be an interactive session because otherwise it's gonna be very boring with me talking. Now, confession that I only wrote my speech last night, so just, it's not prepped and polished and things like that, so just go with me as we do it. All right, I'm gonna kick off. I'm gonna do a welcome to country. I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people and the Yoruba Nation who are the original custodians of the land on which we stand today. I pay my respects as elders, past, present and future and acknowledge Aboriginal people for their custodianship of the land. This is something that I've only just started doing on a regular basis. Um, and it's just something that actually is important to me. I've studied Aboriginal history a little bit in the university course that I'm studying at the moment. And it's something that we don't reflect and think about very often. So I just wanted to bring it into a normal practice in uh, meetups and anywhere else that it happens. We're starting to do it uh, before meetings that we do it at my work and it's just a good way, good, good stop. All right. This is up there because you're standing in the way of me and my wife's 14th wedding anniversary tonight. So <laughs> maybe I'll, I'll let that be a reflection of how much um, I thought it was important to come along and share my story. And I appreciate the opportunity that Rob gave me in doing so. But there, there was some delicate negotiations that had to happen at home. Actually, there wasn't. My wife, Alicia, is fantastic. She said, look, Matt, if you want to do it, go for it. We've been married for 14 years. There's nothing new that you can do for me. <laughs> I'll see you tonight. And it's like, yeah, I'll see you tonight when you're asleep. And I saw her this morning when I was asleep and when she went to the gym at five o'clock. That's just life, isn't it? Sometimes it's bloody busy. But if you needed a place to crash. Yeah. Uh, this is what I was going to do as uh, the agenda of what I want to talk through. So I've been in, not specifically in project space, but I've been impacted by projects for more than 20 years. And um, people look at me and say, I don't look that I'm 20 years old yet, but it's not true. Uh, so I wanted to talk about some of my reflections that I've learned over time. And just to dispel a myth at the start, I am far, far, far from a lean portfolio management expert. So I'm gonna make reference to it, but, <laughs> but it is not something that I am deeply in. Um, I will talk about my experience with it. I'll talk about my thoughts about it. Uh, and a lot of the things that I actually will talk about throughout the presentation will reflect back on uh, lessons that you can learn, that you can implement as part of lean portfolio planning. So background and just some things. I'm gonna share some uh, good news and bad news stories. I'm never gonna say that what we do is best practice, but I'll share what uh, I think is working and I'll share on some things that I don't think have worked very well at the same time. All right. So I wanted to go back, back, back when I first started, um, first started in my first adult employer. I've only worked for two adult employers in 20 something years of working. Uh, but I've actually had a bucket load of jobs over that time. So I've never been stable. I've always moved through the organisation. The most stable I have been is actually in the PMO space. And sorry, I should have actually referenced that at the start. So my current job role and function is a project management office. Um, and that's where I got the call in from Rob to actually come and share my experience in that respect. But I was going to go all the way back and say, 20 years ago when I was first started working, I was young, I was naive, I was innocent in the world, um, but I came into a business that was going through a transformational change. Transformation is a very overused term in some senses, but they were implementing process efficiencies and uh, new ways of working, new machines, new technologies. And my reflection when I remember back at that point in time is I was with a group of people in um, a normal functional office environment and people were actually shit scared about what was going on from project impacts. So I, we had people in the team who were married and had kids and had mortgages. You know, I was young and just out of university, still living at home with my parents. It didn't really worry me. That sort of fear didn't live in the back of my mind. And other people who were a couple of years away from retirement saying, you know, I'm in a pretty low level job. I actually need my work to fund my retirement. And they were worried about project impacts and change. So I didn't think about that at the time. It just wasn't something that I honestly reflected on. But l looking back and reflecting back over the last 20 plus years of working in projects and being impacted by projects, it is really one of my things that I think we have moved too far away from. And that's from both from people who run waterfall projects and people who run agile projects or whatever methodology and whatever thing that you wrap around it. I, my perception, and it's a personal perception, is that in general, people have moved away from talking to the people who are actually impacted by change. And they often just delegate it down to a change manager and say, you go and figure that out, that part out for me, because I don't want to have to worry about it. 
And I wanted to bring it up and reflect it and say, there's actually a real strength in people walking around and talking to people who are impacted by change. And sometimes it's difficult and sometimes it's challenging, but I really think that there is value in people management by walking around type uh, way of working. Uh, that's a, a true and honest reflection that I've tried to bring into things when I'm delivering change. So my next change that I'm going to be delivering is a project portfolio management tool. I've got to get out there and talk to the people at my group in Woolworths and say, how's it going to impact you in your scrum master role? How's it going to impact you as a product owner? How's it going to impact you as a tribal leader? Like, I've got to do that. I've got to talk. I've got to find out what their concerns are because there is no doubt that across that business, there are going to be people who are saying, what the hell is this change and why is it happening? And I don't understand. So conversation is just such a strong way of um, getting to the bottom of those stories. And that has resonated for the rest of the 20 years onwards. That has happened again and again and again. So I just don't think people have done enough to go back. So when people are thinking about um, stuff like lean portfolio management, about what the impacts will be to project teams who are stopping and starting projects, because that's one of the outcomes of lean portfolio is doing that more often. There are impacts to people that it really pays to um, go and talk to those people who are impacted and find out what their concerns are and bring them into your thinking. And I'm sure that everybody here would have had similar similar processes when they were first uh, in the in the workforce and learning those things and probably young and naive like I was in a lot of ways and finding out what the hell is this project change and why is it impacting me uh, and then I want to want to flip it and do a different one so I wanted to say one of the projects that was most successful so that was one of the lessons that I learned I wanted to share one of the projects that was most successful in my mind now this project was a bloody huge project that I was peripherally involved in but again in, impacted a hell of a lot of people at the place I was working at, which was AMP at the time. Um, and it was not a sexy project, and it was not a fun project, and it was a really hard project. But the lesson that uh, I reflected back on and the reason why it was so successful is that program launched and delivered 15 plus years ago, and it is still there today, still there being used every single day. And my lesson from that one was the good old saying that culture eats strategy for breakfast. So like there's, a, there's some really big things that they did. They just didn't go and launch and load and walk away. They did a very long project piece of work and they did a lot of engagement pre-go live and they, they stayed around and stuck around for almost a year. Now that's a very expensive project to run, but I like the saying that one of the general managers at AMP used to say, which is that project saved the company half a billion dollars over time. That's an awful lot of money. And the reality of that project is there were an awful lot of people who ended up not working at that organization longer term because it was a cost cutting efficiency project, but it was the best project because it actually changed the organization. So I've got a couple of bullet points that I wrote down to say why I thought it was effective. Um, and the first one was that actually it provided a transparent system of incentives for the actual staff who were there and who were working in the system. Very, very transparent. So you could actually see and talk about things on a daily basis. So it really hit the what's in it for me type thing that a lot of people matter, that matters to a lot of people. Um, it actually focused on that as a key core deliverable about saying, when we implement this project and talk to people, we're going to tell them what's in it for them. We're not, not going to hide away from it. Like we are going to be transparent on that sort of thing. And it just really, you know, nobody loved it. As I said, it was not a sexy, fun and popular project, but it was successful because it actually addressed that. And then the next one I said is that it used visual management techniques back before it was cool. So it was the first time I'd ever seen uh, whiteboards up all over the business, all in a relatively consistent um, basis. So most people have reported on the same thing. Uh, so people talk about agile and other um, initiatives and methodology and say, visual management is the way of the future. And it's like, no, no, we were using that decades ago. That's been there for a long time, um, but it was really effective. And like, that's something again that I've learned and again that I've used again and again and again in different organizations. And some people don't like it, but it's been incredibly effective. Um, it created endless opportunities uh, for conversations and coachings. And I think most people who are probably agilists in the room um, appreciate the value of good conversations that happen. And this system just allowed for that to happen, a day by day type of reporting, visual management, aware, awareness with the team, um, and a coaching effort so that managers were able to talk to team members who were impacted. So again, lots of people left the employer over this period in time, but it was done in a way that it was obvious as to what was happening, that people had the opportunity to lean in and actually change their behavior and the way that they worked and the way they interacted or choose not to get on that journey and go, go somewhere else. 
Um, there was significant autonomy and autonomy is uh, important. So the team leaders that we implemented out to had freedom to do things differently. It wasn't a cookie cutter approach. It wasn't a one size fix all, but there was a good system of checks and balances. So you could still look at things overall and say, am I on track, am I off track? Is there some things that I need to intervene in here? I can't just give them free autonomy and not keep them accountable for results. What's my checks and balances so that I know that they're on, on track to do so? Um, and like, I'm going to regularly reflect back and say, how does that impact me and how does it impact uh, my thinking in an agile world that I work in now and how does it impact into a lean portfolio? And just that transparency, I've seen where uh, there has been too much autonomy given and in my business we operate under an agile tribal structure and people actually fight against sharing information. They just, they want to be autonomous and do everything within their walls and not share a lot of information. Now that's not a common trait, but there are people who exhibit those sort of behaviours. Um, and just having that checks and balances across the system to say, actually, I need to know more about your tribal velocity and what's happening within the squads. Like, it, it's a fair thing to, to ask for in return. Um, it was stable and consistent. It was supported continuously from management and it was a robust framework rather than micro solutions and it was data rational. So another thing about my background is I, um, like long story, but um, I have a very heavy data background. I was a business analyst. I went and did my master's of finance and I've loved numbers. Some people do, some people don't, but I was one of those people who fell into the camp of loving numbers. And data rational decision making is something that's again stuck with me over time, uh, that I love being able to collect things and it's going to be my next point. Um, but actually having a system that systematised that, you could actually press a button and get data and reports out. I struggle with that at the moment in my current job. I can't get good data, I can't get good information out of systems and I just don't know what's happening in some instances and it just leaves me in the dark. In a PMO perspective, when I think that's part of my job role is to actually make sure that the business is running good program work, getting the deliverables, not having data is a huge, huge problem for me. Cultural words like transparency, visual management, conversations, um, they're all words that relate straight back into agile processes and thinking. Um, so I'm going to move on. I have no idea what these graphs even say, but the important point was to say, when you have data and information, you can actually start telling stories and data rational decision making is such a better way of operating than gut call and instinct. Uh, I reckon businesses are probably relatively good at making gut calls on things. And like, I don't know, does people agree with that? Like, I think people are, most people are pretty good at making data um, gut calls, but they're not perfect, are they? And I have seen gut calls made again and again and again that turn out to be wrong. And it's like, Jesus, guys, you really should have just stopped and considered what was going on there, collected some data to make sure you were making the right decision to proceed. So collecting data, uh, like it realistically, it gave me that leap up in the organisation to be noticed more because I was the data rational person who people could turn to and actually get an answer out of them. Uh, and I was helping out a lot of people in the business actually write their business cases. It's amazing how many people actually had trouble articulating or translating a bloody fantastic idea into a system of numbers you actually be able to stack up and make a return on investment on. Um, it's not a natural skill set that everybody had. And like, I mean, I was, I'd had become good at that sort of thing. So I was the person that people turned to over the business and said, what's the impact of this from a financial perspective and what's my return on it? Um, and I loved working with people doing that sort of work. So um, like I felt I had a really value add role in the organisation doing those sort of things. But I was an incredibly naturally curious person and I was given freedom to say, Matt, you're the finance person. I expect you to be able to answer all the finance numbers but I couldn't answer finance numbers unless I stood, understood the bigger picture. And then that's where I started being given, not given permission, just taking the position actually about saying, I want to understand more, more about why this solution, why didn't you do something alternative or is that the best way of doing it? And how and when and where will that be impacted? And I started to learn all the tricks that the program managers and project managers were trying to do to justify their business cases. Uh, so it's a word of warning if you ever come into an organisation that I'm attached to in a finance role. Like, I know all your tricks already. Don't try and pull the wool over my eyes. <laughs> I've seen it all before. And some of them are pretty impressive tricks, but some of them are just downright dodgy, to be honest. So then, um, building on my finance uh, capability, I then moved into my first program management office role. So 
Um, I actually wasn't going to tell people, Rob, that the employees that I'd worked with, so I was going to keep that a corporate secret. <laughs> but anyway, the cat's out of the bag. So then I left uh, where I was in my comfortable role and went on to the AMP AXA integration program, and that was a huge program of work. So enormous program of work, um, 400 plus million dollars worth of spend over a period of time, went over a couple of years, obviously again, huge impact. And I saw a whole breadth of projects across the whole organisation. And that's where I was finally in a PMO role. And like I found my niche in that respect because I could suddenly see what was happening across the group. And I was one of the few people who actually had that visibility and you could actually make some really um, intelligent insights when the management team are looking at the portfolio to say, I'm the one who's got better, better visibility than a hell of a lot of people do. I can tell you where things are going off the rails. I can tell you where projects actually stack up better against the rest of them. And everybody's got pet projects and things like that. Um, and again, back to data rationality, like I was the one who had more, more capability and more information than the other guys did that would a be able to help them make better decisions. So going into that PMO function and role, like it was a really big change and it was a really steep learning curve. Um, and the way I often describe it is, that's where I learned to speak the language of projects and like project people have their own way of talking with each other. And you'd have conversations like, I need the EA done so that the PO can be GR'd. And it's like, what the, what? <laughs> and it's like, it was just a normal conversation and until you actually learnt that language, you just didn't work within the teams there. So steep learning curve, but I um, dove into it and learned along the way there. So in that role, that's where more than anything else, I learnt my next best lesson in life to share, which is that nobody knows everything. And there is too many teams and businesses and people and processes and functions and tribes and squads and whatever word you want to wrap around it that uh, think that they know the answer to everything. And my lesson was that it just didn't work that way. So we had to engage finance experts, change management experts, risk and compliance experts, as boring as some of them are, um, uh, business analysts who actually know the, the business and the processes behind them, IT architectural people. Like you actually no longer live in that world. <laughs> so, like the agile philosophy talks about end-to-end -end tribes. And I just don't think you ha can have a squad or a tribe that actually has all of the skill set that you need anymore. So you've just got to leverage the people who have the skill sets to talk about it. So I can talk to anybody here about AASB 138 standards. Anybody up for that conversation? Yeah, I didn't think so. Yeah, it bores the crap out of me, but I'm bloody good at it. <laughs> um, and so I can talk to you about capitalization functions from my finance background, but I can't talk to change management. I am far from an expert on there. I know the basics of it, and I can't talk about IT architectural concerns. I have no bloody idea. So do we remember the movie? Thank you very much. When we get to the stage where we can actually download all this information and we can become personal experts, that's going to be a great day, but we are so far away from it at the moment that we've just got to reach out within outside of our um, narrow mindsets and teams to leverage the skill set that other people bring to organisations. Um, and again, so lesson that I have learned and seen uh, broken time and time again that people aren't doing this enough. So from, um, from big projects to small projects, like people just don't do it enough. And um, you know, I, 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 don't know, I don't know what it is that stops people from doing it. Yeah, it's painful to have a conversation with somebody who's a finance expert at times, but if you don't know capitalization standards, you can make a very expensive mistake in your P&L in a year. And you want to have the right people involved in the conversation to make the right decision at the end of the day. And like this is an absolute reality in our job role that we face time and time and time again. So that was my next one. Um, and I met bucket loads of clever people who know a hell of a lot about lots of things, but there was no one guru who knew everything about everything. So leverage your networks was the lesson that I learned. Then we moved on into PMO broader functions within both AMP and Woolworths. And um, this is a really important lesson because I have seen this repeated, this mistake repeated again and again and again through annual cycles, through different employers, through different functions about having this enormous list of work to be done. Uh, and like, I mean, a lot of people probably have visual management boards and they're up there and they've got a whole list of projects that they're gonna promise to deliver in the next quarter. And again and again, what do you see happen? We deliver them all. No, <laughs> no, we don't. So the reality is, and we see it again and again, um, the projects push out into next year or next quarter or whatever it is, 
or you have those listed projects that you have to start going through and having really tough conversations about killing because we just cannot do everything that we commit to. So I think we're often guilty about um, trying to be all things to all people and having the best of intentions when we do that. But lean portfolio management in what I hope to implement is going to be better at making decisions about which ones are we going to start and finish. So not stop starting lots of things, getting most of the way through them or part way through them and then having to kill them and stop having lists of things which people rely on and commit to and build financial plans and P&Ls around that then don't get delivered or people have dependencies on and then they've got to go and replan their whole uh, organisation. Like there's plenty of nods around the room that I'm seeing here, like I'm not alone. <laughs> That's a good thing in my mind. Um, but what is it that stops us from doing that here and now? I don't know because we've just done it again and again and again. So, and I face this problem at the moment at my work about how we can deprioritise things. Um, and like, it's just, it's not a fantastic conversation to have. And there are people who are expecting and relying on some of the promises that were made and commitments that were made earlier on that we now just have to go and constantly replan again. Now, I actually think replanning regularly is a really good thing to do. So one of my things that I want to bring into our version of lean portfolio management is much more rigorous quarterly portfolio management processes where we actually look at everything. Can we do a stop, start, continue uh, review of the whole portfolio at a quarterly basis? Because that's not too far into a project to stop things. And it's not too far into the projects or the life cycles to actually reprioritize things that are coming up next. So I reckon if you do that rather than the uh, the false belief that you can just set the annual plan and that's it, you'll forget it, and then we'll do it again next year and we'll set a new plan. And like it just the reality is it doesn't work. And uh, doing a ad hoc process of running out of money or running out of time or running out of resources or whatever your constraint is there, like having a more rigorous process, we actually do that quarterly portfolio review, make some really strong decisions about what are we going to invest in and why are we going to do it then isn't that going to be a better outcome for everyone? Isn't that going to be more certainty for everybody who's actually looking at what's coming up next? Like, I think it is, but I've just, I have not got over the line on it and implemented. So that is what I want to bring into my lean portfolio thinking when we are implementing it at, um, at Woolworths. I'm going to now talk about a lot of the things that we do at Woolies X is the part of the business area that I'm in. So I mentioned earlier on that we've implemented tribal agile in the business. Um, and I'm going to share some of the, the lessons and learnings and what's changed and particularly from my background that I was so comfortable in that old world of waterfalling and things like that. And going on to Woolies X was a really change. So this is our structure and cadence that we run. No, just joking. <laughs> this is absolutely not the structure and cadence that we run. Um, so I pulled that out of one of the Agile Australia conference um, talks that one of the guys gave and it's like, gee, that's beautiful. It looks like a train track, but it's actually a structured way of a business running their programs. And I look at that and I go, holy shit, like that is a lot of processes and works and documentations. And when you talk about governance heavy, it's like, when I tell you about our one, it's like, let's just contrast the two things we're there. So at Woolies X, we have um, an investment committee, like a pretty common name I imagine, about getting capital funding approved. Uh, our investment committee meets every week on a Wednesday for three out of four weeks. And that's it. That's our structure. That's our cadence. We have one meeting, one forum where people go for requests and that's, they get their capital approved. We've got a core group of people who turn up to those meetings. So we do not have 800 checkpoints prior to getting in there. And this was a big change for me. Like, <laughs> let me tell you, this was a big change for me where I thought, these, these guys are cowboys and crazy. Like, how can you approve hundreds of millions of dollars worth of projects annually based on a single meeting from, and I'll get to it later, a short period of documentation. It's like, I was just out of my comfort zone. But you know what, it works. And it has worked since I've been there, it's only been 18 months, but like it actually works better than the rest of the business. And I'm quite happy to say that. So one meeting, like, yes, we have exceptions. When you're asking for $50 million to build a new business, you've got to go to boards and things like that. But within our area, within the ones that we have control over, one meeting, once a week, that's it, you can be done. You've got your CapEx, it's approved, go and start delivering. So like, I'm, I'm actually quite proud of that. Uh, cadence that we've set up, but having the right people in the room to have that conversation, their purpose is to say, is this customer pain point that we're recognising and is the proposed solution, whether it's mature or not mature, is it in the right direction, does it align with our strategy? 
Is it um, a reasonable amount of investment um, spend and return on it? That's their key questions that they're asking in that committee because the rest of it can be done by the teams. So they can figure out how to implement a solution. They don't have to read a detailed business case that goes through line by line, all of that sort of work. Um, I think it's my next slide. Look at this one. So this is where they rely a lot on gut instinct in the financials because they don't, they don't trust the numbers enough to say, this is going to be directionally right, it's not going to be perfect. But at my old employer, like it was hard asked. If you were given, you had to actually ask for $682,526. Like you had to ask down to the last dollar. You had to bottom up justify every single resource. And the investment committee would go into this level of detail about reviewing them. Jesus Christ, that's a waste of their time. Like these are high paid executives. They don't need to be trawling through Excel spreadsheets to make sure that numbers add up to each other. Like trust the people who are actually asking for the request that they're going to do that, that they're going to cover that. Does it make strategic sense? Does it stack up? Is it directionally what we want to do? And from a relative prioritisation across the whole portfolio, is this the right call to make? That's the key questions that you're asking in the investment committee that we run now, not, not the opposite. This is, I love it. So um, at AMP, we used to have business cases for the multiple stages of it. It was a very traditionally run business. And even though they had agile implementation in a lot of areas, like you still had to do a detailed business case. And that's where I reference back. They were big business cases. I used to love it. Like it was, that was my job in the PMO there. I used to go through my red pen and I was very famous for my red pen and crossing things out and asking questions. And I was doing calculations and things like that. Um, so out of probably the, the minimum you would have at AMP would be a 30 page business case and you would definitely have well and truly over 100 pages at times. Uh, Woolworths business cases, any guesses about how long they are, how big they are? One page, we started with one page and then we ended up with a financial page at the end of it. One page, one page business case. Uh, the big stack of book there to read through every week. The AMP investment committee would go through with that stack of paperwork and read four or 500 pages worth of documentation um, compared to the one page of what's the problem statement and things like that and one page backing it up saying these are the financial um, assumptions and commitments that we're, we're setting for each other uh, and then it will cover non-financial things on the back page as well. So very, very simplified process but when you're only focusing on those key decision points that I turned out, you don't need too much more. So, and again, in 18 months worth of running this with the one page originally and now the two page business cases, like we're not missing too many tricks. We are not failing projects regularly. That is enough information to make a judgment call on it. So that's a big challenge. And like, I, mean, I was so out of my comfort zone when I first saw that, but like, it's a good challenge to take back to your works and say, you know, why do we have this endless stuff as type of documentation that we need to do? Agile talks about um, people over process type thing, like apply some of those principles into the governance structure as a you know, challenge your PMO person um, and tell them that you know, it does work in other organisations. You don't need all this documentation. It's a false security to do so. And I think that's what we had in the past. It was a false security to say, if we don't have all this documentation, how do we know that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing? It's like, don't worry, trust us. <laughs> that's what the Woolworths philosophy is a lot, lot more. It's oh. great. So at Woolworths, we are good at starting projects. You know, you can turn them around in a very short period of time to get them up and running. We are not fantastic at stopping projects and I haven't yet met anybody who says that their organisation has cracked that nut. Um, I talked about the quality portfolio review where you actually do the stop, start, continue. We have not yet embedded that behaviour there. So we still have projects that run too fast, too far before they get stopped. Um, but stopping projects, like to actually go to the answering your question, when I use that example of the plastic bags, it was an easy process to stop because we told the tribes and squads to stop working on that work and now to pick up this prioritised work. So the process was actually relatively painless to do from a practical level, but you know that was an exception. Um, by and large, we don't do it well enough in the rest of instances. And then you see projects, which is um, how good and how often have people talked about when it's done, done. So we know that we can do um, every single feature we can look at and we can cost up and we say, yep, discard that one, we're not doing it. We don't do that well enough at the moment. So stopping projects is a problem and that's why I put this slide on there. Benefit realisation is my next one and I am overly passionate about benefit realisation and I have seen this sort of thing almost play out. Fantastic delivery plan and here's our benefit realisation planning. Big blank page. So I... Um, I I was self-taught in benefit realisation, to be honest. 
uh, because it was not a strong strength in AMP where I used to work. Uh, I mentioned that I went on to the AMP AXA integration program and we had to report to the market about cost savings that we achieved by merging those two companies together and reducing duplication and things like that. And I can honestly say, like, I know AMP has a bad brand, so just get that out there now. But when we were running that program, I could hand, hand on heart stand up there and say, every single dollar that we are telling to the market as a benefit realization from this project related work is absolutely true. And I knew um, bottom up, dollar by dollar, person by person type things. Revenue dollars when we stopped programs or stopped products and things like that. Like I knew everything in better realization at the AMP world. So we had implemented a really strong and robust system. Um, I think it's actually weakened off since I've left there and there you go, the results can show. <laughs> um, but like, I mean, benefit realization I was passionate about because it was my baby at that work. And when I contrast it to where we are in Woolworths, I think Woolworths is quite immature in this space. And I've gone to, this is my first meetup, but I've gone to other forums where similar like-minded people and project professionals get together. And it's a pretty common theme that people come back and say, yeah, we just don't get, or we don't track, or we don't know about the benefits that our um, teams and programs have actually released, whether we've achieved them or not. Um, so like there's a couple of lessons that, it goes back to where I talked about data. There's lessons about benefit realizations that I think we should be more cognizant of. And again, back into lean portfolio management, we need to think about it at the start. There's far too many times when we think about it at the end, which is too late to actually have a baseline to compare things against. And there's just an implicit assumption that somebody's going to pick this up for me. Surely, surely. And nobody does. And there's disincentive in systems and things like that for you know, cost center managers to release budget and all that sort of politics and people come into play there. Um, so benefit management, um, I'm trying very hard to make inroads on, but I've moved away from my finance expertise and I'm in program governance. So like I, I don't have the ability to influence it directly anymore. I've got to influence it um, outside of the team. Um, so that's a big journey on that I'm at the moment. And everybody's supportive of it, but nobody does anything about it. So I've got to recreate the magic that I had at AMP to actually implement those processes. So just at AMP, we had leading budget adjustments. If you made a business case and made a commitment, I'd change your budget before you delivered that project. That was the game changing uh, cultural change that um, made the businesses buy in to actually deliver what had been promised and committed to because you were exposed if you didn't actually deliver against that. You, your results reflected badly when you promised to save a million dollars and you didn't deliver against it. It was a game changing uh, thing to say, we're doing leading budget adjustments rather than lagging budget ones. Um, at Woolworths, we make lots of commitments and we have truly lost track, again, back to data and some of the questions that were asked earlier on. SAP is not very helpful on me being able to say, did we deliver on the commitments that we made last year? I don't know. Like there is no visibility out there at the moment and it's just a big gap in my mind. So Matt's absolutely right in where they're at to at the moment and where many, by the way, I don't want to pick on Woolworths or anybody else for that matter, um, where a lot of our customers are at at the moment is they're getting a lot of benefits in terms of the way that they're delivering, how quickly they can change, all that sort of, like get to market, all that sort of stuff. But they're going so fast, they're not doing a lot of reflection and they're not doing a lot of, and, and as long as the numbers are going up, I can see a very difficult um, conversation being had around um, if you don't get your maturity in place now, wait till the numbers start going down. Right. right. So we had a session um, off the back of some of these conversations uh, with the executive there and the, and the elephant I was talking about in the room was if we can't get what we call a golden thread from the strategy all the way through to implementation and be able to prove that what we're doing is actually implementing this strategy and getting the benefit we expect, then what really gets you is that if I did nothing last year, I could have already, I could have had that same trajectory and spent a whole lot less money, right? And that's kind of, that. all of a sudden there was a bit of an aha moment where they're like, oh shit, I, I could have spent nothing and gotten this growth. We don't know, right? What we, we have a gut feel, right? So it's pretty safe to say that, of course, if you do nothing, you're stable, you're like you're gonna be stabilized, you know, you're not gonna really grow significantly. But what if we did half of what we actually did? would we have actually done better? Maybe we would have spent money on marketing, maybe we would have spent money on, I don't know, recruitment or on whatever, right? We don't know. And so what we're trying to do is build that maturity into the organization, into many of our customers' organizations. Yeah. So we're starting down the pathway of doing better upfront planning and doing OKRs, which are operational key results, I think. I've got the acronym, something like that. Yeah. Close enough, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Last slide. 
So I mentioned at the start that I'm not a lean portfolio management. I've made multiple references to it throughout here, and we have not yet implemented that, but that's a picture of what we would like to do. But I'm not the expert at it, lean portfolio management, um, but I've had my thought processes around it, in particularly around a governance perspective. So bringing back my PMO hat, um, I said that I'm very happy for us to implement this whole model. No troubles, no challenges against it. I just wanna make sure that we cover off the basics, that we know what we're doing, why we're doing it, and what return we're getting against that. And I don't care what methodology is followed behind the scenes, whether it's upfront funding for the whole year or whether it's quarterly funding and things like that, I am ambivalent to that. I just wanna make sure that the core metrics are right. Now, I've never worked in a lean portfolio management fully implemented world, so I can't give you words of wisdom experience from it. It's what we want to get to. Um, it's got really strong advocates in our business that are driving towards it, but it's got big challenges, and the challenges particularly in our business are from the core finance teams, about uh, things that do matter from capitalization perspectives and PL attribution and things like that. Um, how do I know what I've invested to depreciate? Those sort of things are real challenges. And team members who say, um, what am I actually working on? Like this doesn't resonate with them without a good solid explanation behind it. Thank you very much. All I say is I really enjoyed it, so I hope you got something out of it too. <laughs>